cross I was crucified With my Lord I have died I've been justified But I've been sanctified I've been glorified Good evening, everyone. Could you turn your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1, verse 5? 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. And we'll be, uh, uh, we're still in 1 John 1, 9. We'll be there for at least another two, another two weeks, and then we're on to verse 10 and finishing off the chapter. But uh, we're going through different, uh, we're, we're spending our, uh, taking our time in 1 John 1, 9, as I've been pointing out. We uh, took actually four nights to go through the verse and, and with a fine-tooth comb, and now we're looking at some of the things related, uh, some of the problems Questions I want to answer and problems uh, related to verse 9, 1 John 1, 9. And tonight we'll be looking at uh, one of the implications of uh, being uh, confessing our sins. Namely, that it will result when we uh, confess our sins, we'll be experiencing not only fellowship with God, but also intimately connected to that, as we'll see this evening, and I pointed out in the past, we'll be experiencing our sanctification, our salvation, we'll be experiencing eternal life, and our, hint, our prayer life will not be hindered. Uh, it will be hindered if we're out of fellowship with God. So all these things we're going to be looking at here this evening, 
and, uh, and our study of 1 John 1, 9. So let's take a moment of silent prayer. As is our custom, we take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves, to see if we do need to confess our sins. And this is, of course, as we've learned, is uh, restoring us to fellowship with God. And that fellowship must be maintained by obeying the Word of God. And when we're doing that, we're obeying the Holy Spirit. Because as we pointed out many times, 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21 teaches us that the Holy Spirit has inspired the Scriptures. And there's many other passage, passages we've studied with inspiration. But uh, he uh, also uh, speaks to us actively when we're listening to the Word of God or in our own uh, private time in, in prayer, prayerful study of the Word of God. Uh, he is speaking to us at that time through the Word of God. So uh, with that in mind, if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, do not insult God by worrying about these things and thus sinning. Uh, cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. Uh, Philippians, 1 Peter 5, 7, of course, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7 go into greater detail about that principle, not being anxious, but praying instead. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for another day to, you've given to us to fellowship in your word and fellowship with each other through the study of your word. We thank you, Father, for treating us in grace, treating us in a manner that we don't deserve, and operating in love toward us and with uh, sending your Son to the cross uh, for us, uh, for our benefit when we were yet your enemies. And we thank you for also raising us up and seating us with your Son, Jesus Christ, through the baptism of the Spirit, when we were dead in our sins and transgressions. And we just pray, Father, that we would look back at this, these acts of love on, on, on our behalf that you have accomplished through both your Son and the Spirit so that we might uh, be, uh, love you and do what you tell us to do in your word and to be more obedient to you and to uh, live uh, for pleasing you and not pleasing our, our, our fellow uh, uh, human beings who don't have godly uh, principles, godly uh, standards, and help us, Father, to reflect your love in our lives by the way we treat people, treating others the way we'd want to be treated. Uh, we thank you for everyone that is here this evening in the Thompson home and those who might be viewing or listening to this class through the website live or a later date through the recordings on the website. We thank you for each person. We pray that each person would be spoken to through the communication of your word by the power of the Spirit. Uh, we pray that they, the, the Spirit would work mightily and powerfully through them and, and help them to understand what they're learning and help them to apply what they're learning, help them to concentrate all by the power of the Spirit. And we pray that they would be spoken to as individuals where they are in their walk with you and as a corporate unit. We pray that you would empower me to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction this evening. Help me to clearly bring forth your full counsel to your people so that your people can continue to uh, be built up and edified spiritually and thus continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So, Father, we pray for this in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5 is where you should be. Uh, where you should be. We're going to, uh, as we've been doing, reading 1 John 1, 5 to 1 John 2, 2, uh, because they constitute a single paragraph, a single unit. I want to read, as I did last evening, first from the Net Bible, and then I want to read from my translation of that um, that particular uh, pericope, that particular paragraph, before we go into uh, this evening's class, which is regarding the results of confessing our sins. What are the results? What are some of the benefits of confessing sin? So we'll be looking at that in detail tonight. Now it says in 1 John 1, 5 in the Net Bible, now this is the gospel message we have heard from him and announced to you, God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him, and yet keep on walking in the darkness. We're lying and not practicing the truth. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, 
we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we do not bear the guilt of sin, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous, forgiving us our sins, and cleansing us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous one, and he himself is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for our sins, but also for the whole world. Now, if I, if I may, let me read those same verses in my translation. Now, this is the message which we have heard from him, so that we're now imparting to each of you, namely that God is light. Indeed, in him, there's absolutely no darkness, none whatsoever. If any of us enters into making the claim that we've been experiencing fellowship with him, yet we've been living in the darkness, then we are lying to ourselves. Consequently, we are unequivocally not practicing the truth. On the other hand, if any of us does at any time live in this light, as he himself is that light, then we are experiencing fellowship with one another. Consequently, the blood of Jesus, his son, does cause each one of us to be purified from each and every sin. If any of us enters into making the claim that we never experienced the guilt of sin, then we are deceiving ourselves. Consequently, the truth is unequivocally not existing in us. If any of us does at any time confess our sins, he is characterized as being faithful as well as just to forgive these sins for the benefit of each one of us. In other words, to purify each one of us from each and every unrighteous thought, word, or action. If any of us enters into making the claim that we have never sinned, then we are making him out to be a liar. Consequently, his word is unequivocally not existing in us. Then it says in chapter 2, verse 1, My dear children, I am presently writing these things for the benefit of each of you in order that each of you would not enter into committing a sin. However, if anyone enters into committing a sin, we possess an advocate with the Father, namely Jesus, who is the Christ, who is a righteous person. For you see, he himself is the propitiatory sacrifice for our sins, indeed by no means for ours only, but in fact also for the entire world. So that's uh, in my translation, 1 John 1, 5 to 1 John 2, 2. Now the confession of sin by the believer not only enables us as believers to experience fellowship with God, but also it enables us to experience our salvation. To experience salvation is to experience fellowship with God. Or vice versa, to experience fellowship is to experience salvation. They are one and the same. So to experience salvation is speaking of fellowship from the perspective that we're experiencing the deliverance that was given to us at the moment of our conversion in a possessional sense. Deliverance from eternal condemnation. Deliverance from personal sin. The sin nature, Satan and his cosmic system, spiritual and physical death. So experiencing salvation is describing fellowship again from the perspective that it's a deliverance from eternal condemnation, condemnation from the law, spiritual and physical death, personal sin, enslavement from the sin nature in Satan and his cosmic system. Now the Christian salvation is, or their deliverance we could say, because that's what salvation is about, deliverance. The Christian salvation or deliverance, like sanctification, as we'll look at this evening, is accomplished in three stages. We talked about this with the relation to the forgiveness of sins. Three stages, positional, experiential, perfective. This is true of salvation, and this is true also of our sanctification as well. Positional, what does that mean? It means at the moment you and I exercise faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, we were delivered posi positionally from spiritual death, eternal condemnation, the devil is cosmic system, the sin nature, all through the crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session of Jesus Christ. And uh, we see that by positionally, as I pointed out many times in the past to you, I mean that God views us as crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ. Why? Because we are under his headship. We are united to him. He's the head, we're the body. He's the vine, we're the branches. 
what is done to him through the cruci his crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session is done to us because we're under his headship. In the same way, we were condemned by the Adam. Though we didn't commit that sin in the garden, we were condemned with him because we were under his headship, his federal headship. And when we trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior the first time, we entered into the headship of Christ under his headship. We're united to him. So God looks at Jesus Christ, his son, as the head of the new humanity, the last Adam. And we are members of his body. So whatever happened, if we're members of his body, whatever happened to Christ, God is basically ascribing it to us, these things that we just mentioned. Crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and session. It's very important to understand because those events in Jesus' life provided for us our so great salvation and sanctification. So in other words, the positional aspect of the believer's salvation refers to the past action of God saving us from these things, from sin, from Satan, this cosmic system, from eternal condemnation when we first trusted in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Now the believer's deliverance positionally it sets up the potential for, the, for us to experience our deliverance in time. It's a, and, and the reason why it's a potential is because we could live in disobedience to God's word and not experience that deliverance. Thus the importance of confessing our sins followed by obeying God's word to stay in fellowship with him. So the believer's uh, pos deliverance positionally sets up the potential for them to experience this deliverance in time because this deliverance can only be experienced after conversion or after justification, you can say, through obedience to the teaching of the Word of God. Now, the positional aspect of our salvation, it also, as we saw in the past, we studied this subject of salvation in great detail, remember, between books, this positional aspect of our salvation not only speaks of the past act of God saving us, but it, it also that it sets up the potential for us to experience this salvation or deliverance in time through obedience to his word, but it sets up the guarantee. It gives us the guarantee that you and I will be delivered in a perfective sense at the rapture, which is a term for the resurrection of the church. And so that's, uh, that resurrection of the church has the believer's volition is not involved in it whatsoever. It's the sovereign decision of God. At that moment, it could happen at any time. It's imminent. That's why you hear me say that we need to live in light of the imminency of the rapture or the, our death, whichever comes first. So we need to understand that in a perfective sense, we will be permanently delivered from all those things that Jesus saved us from. At the, and that's so they are the three stages. Experiential, the experiential aspect of our sanctification means this. After our justification, or in other words, our conversion, the believer, you and I, can experience this deliverance by appropriating by faith the teaching of the word of God that we've been crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ. And this constitutes our spiritual life after being delivered from these things. In other words, the experiential aspect of our salvation is used of our deliverance from sin, Satan, and his cosmic system in the present moment. So think of positional, it's the past act of saving us. Experiential, the present moment we're, we're in right now. Perfective, the future. Okay? So you get past, present, future. Why is it, uh, remember, we're in, a, we're in an interesting stage. We're in, a, in between. God, this is what God's done for us. This is how he views us. This is what it, we're going to be in the future, forever, for all of eternity. But we're not there yet. That's why you, you, many theologians, they call it uh, not, uh, already but not yet. And that's because we're in between those two uh, aspects of our sanctification and salvation. And so this means that we have to, because we still have a sin nature, we still live in the devil's world, we have a volition, and we could give in to that sin nature, we could give in to the devil and his lies, and, say, and, 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 and listen to them. And so therefore, the need for confession of sin, and to be restored to fellowship with God, and we need to appropriate by faith our identification with Christ in those events in Jesus' life, so that we can experience this so great salvation and our sanctification. So the perfective aspect of our salvation is this, at, as I said before, at the resurrection, the rapture of the church, you and I will be delivered in a perfective sense and permanently. 
from the devil, his cosmic system, the sin nature, when we receive that resurrection body at the rapture of the church, which is imminent. Uh, the, uh, the perfective aspect is uh, mentioned in Romans 13, 11, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, Hebrews 9, 28, 1 Peter 1, 5. In other words, the perfect, perfective aspect of our salvation is used of our future deliverance from sin, Satan and his cosmic system. Now, uh, let me show you this uh, in, uh, uh, you can hold your, uh, hold your place. Go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, verse 20. Philippians 3, 20. But our citizenship is in heaven, and we also await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who, the Lord Jesus Christ, will transform these humble bodies of ours uh, humiliating bodies, you could translate it, into the likeness of his glorious body, a glorified resurrection body. How is he going to do that? By means of that power by which he is able to subject all things to himself. So through his omnipotence will be changed and our bodies, which are humiliating bodies, really, in relation to the resurrection body we're going to have, because we have the presence of the sin nature. Remember, back to the dust of the ground you shall go, Adam and Eve and your progeny. Uh, you will go back to the dust of the ground, one of the, cur the curses upon them, and, their, and the progeny, which is the human race. And so why is that? The body, has, in the genetic structure of the body, it's like a virus, and it, it, caught, it actually is the reason why we have viruses and disease and sicknesses, and we eventually die physically because of that presence of the sin nature. That's why Paul calls our human bodies now a body of sin. And God wants to deliver us from that, ultimately in a perfective sense, so we will never get sick and, and die physically again, or have any kind of cold or whatever kind of physical ailment. That's going to be all from the, in the past one day to us. As, and, and as you, you, you'll appreciate that, uh, you know, people who are middle-aged and have physical problems, or they could be young people, and they, uh, or they're older people, Christians, and they really look forward to that. And I've had some friends in my past who had serious physical problems and had gone home to be with the Lord, and they would mention to me, uh, looking forward to having that resurrection body. In fact, I had a, there was a friend of mine, uh, uh, he died of, um, uh, uh, was a di he had a bad diabetes. In fact, this wasn't Mike Wolf who had diabetes, but he had a, a, somebody I knew back east, and he had uh, the, the worst kind of diabetes, and he, I mean, he couldn't see anymore because of it. He, he had to get his leg amputated, and I mean, when he was in the hospital, he was, he, somebody told me he was about ready to go with the Lord. He was in rough shape, and they said, hey, you should give him a call. I said, oh, great. I didn't know he was, he was, he was in that bad shape. Call him up, and he sounded great, but he was like saying, I can't wait to get out of here and get, you know, and, and be uh, delivered from this, this, uh, this uh, mortal coil, this, this, this body of mine, which is deteriorated, so I can get my resurrection body. And so uh, he looked, it was a great encouragement to him, and we should be encouraged by that as well. So there's a, 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 a if you, in fact, look at uh, Romans chapter 13. Show you some verses this is, a, this is a verse in Romans 13 that talks about our deliverance in a perfective sense, our salvation in a perfective sense in the future, which actually uses the word salvation in the passage. Romans, uh, Romans 13, 11, and do this because we know the time that is already the hour for us to wake from sleep. For our salvation is now nearer than when we became believers in the past. So he's saying it's future. It hasn't arrived yet. So the salvation is future. The night is advanced, verse 13, toward dawn. The day is near, so then we must lay aside the works of darkness and put on the weapons of light. In view of the fact that we're going to be delivered in a perfective sense. Let us live decently as in the daytime, not in carousing and drunkenness, when that, look, that stuff usually happens at night, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in discord and jealousy. 
Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, meaning appropriate by faith your identification with him, and make no provision for the flesh to arouse its desires. Uh, now, I want to I take a look at the, uh, the, uh, pr- the positional aspect of our salvation, meaning the past act where God saved us at the moment of our conversion. And what passage can we look at for that? Uh, well, we can look at Ephesians chapter 1. Look at Ephesians chapter 1. Look at Ephesians 1 3. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly place realms in Christ. For he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world, that we may be holy and unblemished in his sight and love. He did this by predestinating us to adoption as his son through Jesus Christ according to the pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace that he has freely bestowed on us in his dearly loved son. In him, his son, We have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He did this when he revealed to us the secret of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ, toward the administration of the fullness of the times, to head up all things in Christ, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we too have been claimed as God's own possession since we were predestined according to the the one purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to set our hope on Christ would be to the praise of his glory. And when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, notice the past tense, when you believed in Christ, there's the positional aspect of our salvation, you were marked with the seal of the promised Holy Spirit, who is the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Uh, Look at 1 Corinthians, I think it is. Let me, before you go there, it's in 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Yes, verse 1. It's another passage in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 I could take you to, but look at 1 Corinthians 15, 1. So we looked at the, the perfective, Aspect of our salvation will be perfected in the perfected in the future with the resurrection. We looked at the past uh, uh, aspect, the positional aspect of our salvation, the moment of our justification, conversion. Now we're looking at the experiential aspect of our salvation. First Corinthians fifteen one. Now I want to make clear for you, brothers and sisters, the gospel that I preached to you. Notice the past that you received. Okay, there's their conversion, their their positional aspect of their salvation. And on which you stand. And the word stand there is in the perfect perfect tense. Past act. It's an intensive intensive perfect. Meaning it emphasizes the present state or results uh, from a past action. Okay. By which. Now look what he says. And by which gospel you. Not in the past now. He's saying by which gospel you were being saved. You've heard me say many times, don't cookie cut the word gospel or salvation because they're not always used of the, of the conversion experience or the gospel in relation to the unsaved. The gospel is used in relation to the believer. We did that in Romans, we saw that. It's in Ephesians 6. And it's there in 1 Corinthians 15, 2. By which gospel you are being saved. Here's the condition where you, is the condition attached to you being saved in the presence, meaning deliver, experience your deliverance your salvation in the present, if you hold firmly to the message I preached to you, the word of God I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I, pa- then he goes on to tell, talk about uh, the eyewitness test, uh, this Christ fulfilling the scriptures with his resurrection and death, and then he was eyewitness, he was one of the uh, many eyewitnesses, Paul was, to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But notice, I took you that verse, verse 2, because it talks about you can experience this salvation. You can experience being saved when you hold to what the teaching of the word of God, the gospel, preached to you, Paul says. So that's the experiential aspect of our salvation. So there's the three stages. Now, to continue forward, not, that not only does the confession of sin enable you and I to experience our fellowship with God in our salvation, 
but also our sanctification, as I pointed out. Remember, experiencing sanctification is describing experiencing fellowship with God from the perspective that it's experiencing being a set, set apart to serve God exclusively. This is very important. I'm amazed how many Christians don't pick up on this. But, you know, the word sanctification, uh, even justification, but let's talk about the relation to fellowship. Sanctification, experiencing your sanctification, experiencing your salvation, experiencing eternal life. Those are all metaphors to try to describe what it's like to commune with God. It's describing fellowship from different perspectives. They're different metaphors. Okay? This is what Paul uses. Now, it's interesting, you don't see John use these metaphors. He uses something else. He talks about, as we see, we'll see in 1 John chapter 2, uh, in chapter 1 we saw, walking in the light. He uses that metaphor. He, he talks about knowing the Lord experientially in chapter 2, we'll say, in 1 John 2. Very important. So just like I will use certain analogies or d metaphors to describe certain things, the, the biblical writers did the same thing. I'm not putting myself on a par with them. You know that. I'm just telling you, this is how they did this. And that's why you hear John will use different language than Paul, though they're speaking of the same thing. When we get to chapter 2, 1 John 2, verses 20 and 27, John comes out and says, you have an anointing. And the anointing is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Though he doesn't use that phrase, indwelling of the Holy Spirit, like Paul does in, first, in Romans 8, 11, and 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, and 1 Corinthians 3, 16, and other places. John uses the term anointing. So they use different language. Peter uses his language, although... It's interesting, you read 1 Peter, it sounds a lot like Paul's language, because he read Paul. So, experiencing our sanctification is describing experiencing fellowship with God from the perspective that it's experiencing being set apart to serve God exclusively. That's what sanctification is. You and I have been set apart to serve God exclusively, and not to live for self. Remember the articles we studied the Exodus, the articles in the tabernacle. They were said to be set sanctified. And the priests were. What does that mean? Those articles were exclusively set apart for the worship of the Lord. And were to be used for nothing else. You and I are instruments. Human beings who are instruments of God, in the hands of a mighty God. So we're set to, said to be set apart to serve Him. So sanctification is a technical theological term for the believer who's been set apart through the baptism of the Spirit at the moment of conversion in order to serve God exclusively and like salvation and the forgiveness of sins. It's accomplished in three stages. Positional, experiential, and perfective. The baptism of the Spirit, we studied this in detail in the past, results in positional sanctification and the potential to experience sanctification in time and the guarantee of perfective sanctification at the resurrection of the church. So I got this language again, positional, experiential, perfective, that I use for salvation, and I'm using it for sanctification. But we're going to go through these three stages from the perspective of sanctification, because they are talking about fellowship and our eternal relationship with God from a different perspective than salvation is, the language of salvation that Paul uses in John. So by positional, I mean that God views us as crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ, since at the moment of conversion, the Holy Spirit placed you and I in union with Christ, identified us with Christ in his crucifixion. Uh, that's in Romans 6.6, 6, Galatians 2.20. We were identified with him in his death, Romans 6.2, 6, 6 7, and 8, chapter 6, verses 7 and 8. Colossians 2.20 and 3.3, 3, as we studied in the past, in our studies in Colossians. We were identified with him in his burial, Romans 6, 4 says that. Colossians 2, 12. We're also identified with him in his resurrection. Romans 6, 5. Ephesians 2, 6. Philippians 3, 10 and 11. Colossians 2, 12 and 3, 1. And also, we're identified with Christ in his session at the right hand of the Father. Ephesians 2, 6 and Colossians 3, 1. We'll take a look at some of these. Positional sanctification is therefore our entrance into the plan of God for the church age, resulting in eternal security, as well as two categories of what we call positional truth. 
What do I mean by that? Positional truth. Well, there's two categories. Retroactive, we call it, positional truth, and current positional truth. Retroactive simply means this. Uh, it means that our identification with Christ and his death and burial, it talks about that. Or in other words, when Christ died, the Father considers you and I to have died with him. Now, current positional truth means that when Christ was raised and seated at the right hand of the Father, the Father considers us to be raised and seated with him as well. Why? Because we're under his headship. We're united to him. He's the head, we're the body. He's the vine, we're the branches. We're united to him. This is very important. If we're the body and, and Christ is the head, that means God's looking at us as he looks at his son. Not the second member of the Trinity, but under his headship and united with him in those events in Jesus' life which provided us our so great salvation and sanctification. So this is very important in, in, in uh, theological truth because it's related to our walk with God. Now, positional sanctification is uh, three, th th uh, uh, four points, and I mentioned this with regards to salvation. One, positional sanctification means this. It's what God has done for us Two, through the Son and the Spirit. Two, it's the way he looks at us. Remember that song I wrote, Jesus Colored Glasses? That's God's looking at us through Jesus Colored Glasses, not through Adam Colored Glasses anymore. Number three, positional sanctification sets up the potential to experience sanctification in time. Why is it a potential? We sin. And we could say, no, I'm not going to confess my sins and say no to obeying God's word. If we confess our sins to be restored to fellowship with him, and obey his word, then we're going to experience our sanctification in time. Number four, it's what the belief, it provides us, our positional sanctification provides us with the guarantee of receiving that resurrection body that we pointed out with relation to salvation. Experiential sanctification, that's the function of our spiritual life in time. And well, it should be because it's synonymous with fellowship with God. Experiential sanctification, in other words, is the post-conversion, or we could say post-justification experience of the believer who's in fellowship with God. How do you get in fellowship with God? Confess the sin when you need to, and then obey his word to stay in fellowship. It's only a potential, as I pointed out, because it's contingent upon you and I responding to what God has done for us at the moment of our conversion through his Son and the Spirit. Therefore, only believers who are obedient to the word of God, will experience sanctification in time. And number three, perfective sanctification is like the perfective aspect of our salvation. It's both, they're both related to the resurrection of the church, the rapture of the church, when you and I are perfected in a resurrection body with no more sin nature to drag us down and to war against. It's the guarantee, perfective sanctification is the guarantee of a resurrection body, and it'll be experienced by every believer, regardless of their response in time to what God has done for them at justification. In other words, if you, you're a believer that died the sin to death, you're going to experience this too. You're not going to get rewards at the bayment seat, but you're definitely going to, everybody gets a resurrection body, regardless of whether you were faithful or not. All three stages of sanctification, people, refer to the process of conforming you and I into the image of Christ. Isn't that the Father's plan from eternity past? Oh yeah. Look at Romans chapter 8. Please. You were just there a little while ago. Look at Romans 8. We'll look at verse 28. We'll start there. Famous passage. Everybody likes the quote. Look at Romans 8. And we know, Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 28, Romans 8, 20, 28, I couldn't say 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, who are called according to his purpose, because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. There's the plan for our lives, Father, the Father says to us. That's the plan of God for our lives. 
not to become rich and famous, not to acquire so many possessions, then we die and we leave them behind. It's not so we can get the approbation of people, become a rock star, you know. It's, we're not here to please anybody but God. If you don't get that, you're going to be a failure in life. That's right. I don't do it, I'm a failure. Everything comes down to pleasing God. We do everything to please Him. And here's, here's very, people say, you ever think about this? What should be our motivation to please, to, to please Him? We're afraid to get disciplined? That's a good reason, but really, what should your real reason be? Your real reason is love for what He's done for you and I. I love you, God, for looking, look, why do you think Paul spends so much time in Romans? Basically, the first eight chapters, or the first three chapters of Ephesians, or the first three chapters of Colossians, to talk to them about what God has done for them in the, through the Son and the Spirit in the past. Why do you think God kept on saying to the Exodus generation in Israel, look what I did for you. I delivered you from the Pharaoh of Egypt with a mighty hand. And our deliverance is greater than that. Look back. You should obey him and want to please him because you love him and you love him and I love him. We love him because of what he did for us. That's why. And if you, and, and if you don't love him, what's wrong? What do you mean? There's a curse, it says, Paul says in 1 Corinthians. Those who don't love the Lord are under a curse. You've got to love, why do you think he said in, in, in to the, uh, one of the churches, I can't remember the top of my head, in Revelation 2 and 3, you lost your first love. Our love for him should be very, uh, very rich, very deep, because, he, because of what he's done for us. All right? So then he, said, so he says there in verse 29, because those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. So there's the plan of God for our lives. Now, I want you to go, we're gonna, let's go through these three stages. Positional, experiential, and uh, perfective. So in, when we talk about positional sanctification, we're talking about the fact that when Christ died, we, when he was crucified, we were crucified. God considers us to be crucified with him, to have died with him, to have been buried with him, raised and seated with him. That's how God views us. That is what he's done for us through the, uh, the baptism of the Spirit. So let's look at a couple of passages which talks about sanctification. And I think the big one, I think, is Romans 6. There's also Colossians 2 that we study. But let's go to Romans 6 because I want to go there because it really actually gives it actually fuller picture, and we're already in Romans, uh, than Colossians 3 does. Look at Colossians, uh, Romans 6, 1. Now, right on the, Romans 6 is right on the heels of the last half of Romans, right, right on the heels of what? At the end, Romans 5, 12 through 21, what was Paul talking about? Christ, he's comparing the first Adam with the last Adam, Christ. Christ, what, what uh, Christ gained for us, negated what Adam did in the garden, and he, and he basically, uh, uh, gave us much more than what we ever lost in the Garden of Eden with Adam. Uh, he is he's basically comparing the headships of Adam and Christ. We're into Christ, the place of blessing. Romans 6.1. Now he's going to develop this uh, being united to Christ. Romans 6.1, and he brings in the metaphor of sanctification and our identification with Christ in his crucifixion, death, burial, and resurrection, and session at the right hand of the Father. Uh, Romans 6.1. What shall we say then? Are we to, to remain in sin so that grace may increase? And now, of course, he's taking the arguments of the opponents that he's had over the years, and basically he's going to uh, give, bring out their arguments and then refute them. Absolutely not. How can we who die to sin still live in it? Say that? There's our identification with Christ in his death. We died to sin, the sin nature when we were died with Christ. When did that happen? When the minute we trusted in Jesus, the Holy Spirit identified us with Christ in his death, Therefore, we're not only dead to the sin nature, as Paul brings out in Romans 7, for the, the, the Jewish Christians, you're dead to the law. Or do you not know that as many as were baptized into Christ Jesus, baptized meaning identified with, were identified with his death, 
baptized into his death. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death. And why? In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may live a new life. I like that translation by the Net Bible. Eternal life there, which we're going to talk about in a few moments. We can, when we confess our sins, we're experiencing eternal life. When we're appropriating by faith our identification with Christ, we're going to experience that new life, eternal life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, and the Greek says, this is a, for the sake of argument, and it's true, we will certainly also be united in the likeness of his resurrection. Guarantee of a resurrection body. Guarantee the perfective aspect of our sanctification and salvation. We know that our old man was crucified with him. Why? So that the body of sin would no longer dominate us. So that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. We're free from the sin nature, people. We don't experience it because we give into it. And most of the time, a lot of times what Christians try to do is they try to fight the war with sin themselves. No. Your focus can't be on stopping an act of sin. Obey God and you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, Paul says to the Galatians, and you won't fulfill the desires of the flesh. Listen to me. Galatians 5. The Spirit wars not against us. Or the flesh wars against, not against us, but the Spirit. And vice versa. So when we obey what the Spirit's saying in the Word of God, that we're crucified, died, buried, raised, and seated with Christ, what's that mean? Well, we're going to be victorious over the sin nature. Occupied with the Lord and His Word and our position with Christ and our identification with Him, we won't sin. If we're occupied and our minds are filled with the Word of God, we won't sin. We sin because we stop thinking the Word of God, we forget, we get lazy, we lack discipline. As we grow spiritually, we will gain a discipline. Holy Spirit will help us there. Don't, don't be, if you're battling sin, we all are. Don't get discouraged. You got the victory. Just keep looking back at him and obey him because he lo- what in mind. Remember what he's done for you and I and keep plugging away. One day at a time. One moment at a time. Okay? And don't get discouraged because you're not the Apostle Paul. Who is? And even he had a battle too. He struggled too. Of course he did. He was just like us. So then it says, verse 7, for someone who has died has been freed from sin. That's what God says about us. Why don't we, ex- we don't experience it because we're not appropriating by faith our identification with Christ. And I'm going to show you how, what, he, what that means, appropriating, later on in the chapter. Look at verse 8. Now, if we've died with Christ, and the Greek is, for the sake of argument, we have died with Christ, and we have, they'd all agree because that's true. He just said this. We believe that we'll also live with him. We know that since Christ has been raised from the dead, he's never going to die again. Death no longer has mastery over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you, now here's the application, here's the appropriating by faith, your identification with Christ and his death and resurrection. So you too, consider yourselves, notice the thinking word there, consider, adopt the view of God, adopt the view God has of you and I, consider yourselves dead to sin, why? Because you died with Christ, right? And alive to God in Christ Jesus. What do you mean? Because you're raised with Christ. Faith is is agreeing with God. That confession of sin is agreeing with God, that it's sin. When we appropriate by faith our identification with Christ and his death and resurrection, we're agreeing with God. I agree with you. I adopt my view of you. Your view of me, I adopt. I'm holding to. Therefore, he says, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its desires. And do not present your members to sin as instruments to be used for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who are alive from the dead, because you're raised with Christ. And your members to God as instruments to be used for righteousness, for sin, will have no mastery over you, because you are not under law, but under grace. Don't stop. It gets even better. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Absolutely not. Do you not know that if you present yourselves as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one you obey, either of sin resulting in death, and that's talking in the context of believers, temporal spiritual death, in other words, loss of fellowship with God. Not being in fellowship with God is a type of death in Paul's language. He's talking to believers who are saved. 
Not talking about uh, eternal lake of fire. Not talking about physical death there. So he says, for you, uh, he says, uh, either sin resulting in death or obedience resulting in righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves to sin, you obeyed from the, the heart that patent of teaching you were entrusted to and have been, having been freed from sin, you became enslaved to righteousness. I'm speaking in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. Okay? Experiencing your sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were freed with regards to righteousness. So what benefit did you then reap from those things that you're now ashamed of? For the end of these things is death. Loss of fellowship with God. Spirit, temporal death, we call it. But now freed from sin... At the moment of your conversion, through the baptism of the Spirit, and enslaved to God, same moment too, you have your benefit leading to sanctification. And look at this, and the end is eternal life. For the payoff of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So there you have, talking about the positional aspect of our sanctification, experiential and also in a perfective sense. Colossians chapter 2 does the same, does the same thing, but not as, as in the, he doesn't explain it in as great detail as he does in Romans chapter 6. Now, I want to continue forward, and uh, we're, uh, we're coming near the end here. Not only does the confession of sin enable us to experience our fellowship with God, our salvation and sanctification, but also eternal life, which is actually seen in that passage in Romans. Uh, uh, look at Galatians. Oh, we actually saw it once before you go to Galatians. D you, if you look at Romans 6.4, look at Romans 6.4. Remember we just read this and I pointed it out to you? Look at Romans 6.4. Oops, I'm going to write by it. Romans 6.4. Therefore, we've been buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too may walk, uh, live a new life. Experience, it's eternal life. The new life. Eternal life is something new to the sinner who was condemned before a holy God. He didn't have it. He had soul life. We have soul. Eternal life is what? As we'll see, in, we saw this a couple of weeks ago, I think. Gen, uh, John 17, uh, was it verses 1 through 3. It's experiencing fellowship with God. It's having an experiential knowledge of God. Meaning, you're personally encountering God. And you do that through his word. How we, are we... Thinking about this, the Spirit inspires the Word of God. He's speaking to us through the Word of God. When I'm in my study, I'm communing with God. God's talking to me. And when I pray to Him, I'm talking to Him. I'm communing with Him. I'm personally encountering God. Have you, and when I'm, hopefully, you know, when you're standing in Bible class, you're seeing that God's speaking to you through the pastor as a function of His gift. You're coming in contact with God. God's speaking. That's why I don't... I don't want people, you know, moving around or anything. I'm, I'm teaching God's word. I want you to listen to what God's word has to say. That's it. And just listen to what I'm saying. Block out everything else. I take care of everything in the room when I'm teaching. And just focus on me. That's what we need to do. God is speaking. And that demands reverence and respect. Not so much for Bill. It's for God. Okay? And I've said this a million times. If you don't think for one minute that God's speaking to me, you should go somewhere else or shit me out. It's actually probably you shit me out of the house, which you would do. That's that really, I, I would never sit and speak to, or listen to somebody who I don't think God is speaking to. The only way you know if I'm speaking to you, if God's using me to speak to you, is through what? The Holy Spirit that indwells you. He confirms it. Or he says, no, this guy's like a pretender. He's a, he's a, he's a fake. And then you get them out of there. Which some people have obviously don't like me, so they get me out of here. So, Galatians 2.20. A couple more passages. Look at Galatians 2.20. Galatians 2.20. Look what Paul says. He appropriates by faith 
his identification with Christ and his crucifixion. I have been crucified with Christ. That's him saying, basically practicing what he's teaching in Romans. I'm crucified with Christ. Why? Because that's how God views me. I'm crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. How can he say that? I died with Christ on the cross. Bill Winston died at 19 when he got saved. I died. I was dead. Gone. Same with Paul. When he believed in Jesus, on that road to Damascus, he died. Then look at what he says. But Christ lives in me. When was the last time you thought about Christ lives in you and I? We saw that in Colossians 120, was it 127. You, the, the mystery is Christ in you. That's amazing. I think it's the great, that's unbelievable. I mean, unbelievable meaning, um, that's awesome. I mean, I don't mean to leave, I can't believe it. It's awesome. So, look at this. It kind of ties into everything. So the life I now live in the body, I live because of the faithfulness of the Son of God. I don't really like the translation. In faith in the Son of God, I like. Who loved me. Here's his motivation for doing this. Who gave himself up for me what I talked about earlier. So, I want you to go another passage. Go to John's Gospel. I mentioned a few moments ago. Look at John 17. In our Lord's great high priestly prayer, recorded in John 17, the Lord states that eternal life is knowing the Father experientially. That's eternal life. It's not just no beginning and no end. We always think of it in the temporal aspect. But Jesus says it's experiencing, knowing him experientially. What does that mean? Personally encountering him through the process of fellowship, sanctification, salvation, however you want to describe it, and being changed by it. Moses went up to the mountain. Second time. Came back 40 days, 40 nights. By the way, he, he didn't eat 40 days and 40 nights. You can't survive without water. He didn't drink anything, he said, either. 40, so that was, a, that was God sustaining Moses on the mountain, by the way. That's a little side there. But he came down. He had to put a veil on his face. He was affected by that encounter with the Lord those 40 days and 40 nights up there in the mountain the second time. He was affected by that personal encounter with the Lord. And so eventually, when we're having fellowship, we want to see, people should start seeing Christ in us. They need to, and, and, and don't think, I mean, the portrait of Jesus is in the scriptures, painted by the Holy Spirit. And he wants us to be saturated with that. And to eventually, as, we, as time goes by, and we keep persevering and we keep, uh, we stay uh, per persevering and, and not quit and stay disciplined, the people start seeing, they're probably seeing it already, for all we know. We hope so. Once in a while, God will give you a little, I'll throw you a bow and say, hey, you know, give you confirmation. Yeah, I see Christ in you, somebody will say. Or they'll say something that will encourage you. Or you'll hear something in, in class where the Holy Spirit will encourage you that, yeah, this is going on in my life. Christ is being formed in me. So he wants a lot of, all, God wants a lot of little Jesus running around this earth. Why do you think, that, why do you think Satan is against the church? He hates Jesus, he hates us. Every single one of you has the potential to do great things for God because you have Christ in you. Do you believe it? John 17. When Jesus had finished saying these things, he looked upward to heaven and said, Father, the time has come. He didn't say, Father. Uh, he didn't come from Massachusetts, by the way. <laughs> Little joke. Father... I'm trying, to, I'm trying to work on my R's that I drop. Father, the time has come. You ever notice that I have a hard time saying hours? I have to really work hard to go hours. Father, the time has come. Glorify your son so that your son may glorify you. Just as you have given him authority over all humanity so that he may give eternal life to everyone you have given him. A relation, basically, when he says that, a relationship with the Trinity. Because they're all life. They're all eternal life. They have that attribute. Think about that for a second. Have you ever? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have eternal life in themselves. When, he, when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior, we receive that eternal life in the presence 
of three members of the Trinity inside of us. So we have eternal life by virtue of their presence in us. So that he may give eternal life to everyone you've given him. Now this is eternal life. He's going to define it. That you, that they know. And the word there is talking about a knowledge that's an experience, an experiential knowledge, meaning you're personally encountering God through the process of fellowship. And how do you have fellowship with him? Obey his word. That they know you, Father, the only true God. And when you know the Father, you know the Son and the Holy Spirit because they're equal in nature and character. They know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. I glorified you on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me at your side with the glory I have had with you before the world was created. So eternal life is appropriated after conversion by you and I when we obey the spirit of life who reveals the will of the Father of life through the communication of the word of life. The believer who exercises faith in the teaching of the word of God that they have been crucified, died, buried, raised, and seed with Christ will experience eternal life in time. We just saw that in Romans 6. The confession of sin, people, and we'll uh, come to the end here. Confession of sin by the believer, not only enables us to experience fellowship with God, our salvation, sanctification, and eternal life, but the filling of the Spirit. Uh, Ephesians 5.18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. That's the net uh, numeric standard. My translation of that verse, do not permit yourselves to get into the habit of, obe- uh, of in- do not permit yourselves to get into the habit of being drunk with wine, because that is nonsensical behavior, but rather permit yourselves on a habitual basis to be influenced by the means of the Spirit. How do you do that? Who's speaking to the Word of God that He's inspired? The Holy Spirit. What do you do when you obey? You're being influenced by Him. The filling of the Spirit takes place when you and I are obeying the voice of the Spirit, which is heard through prayerful study of the Word of God. It's not an emotion, though it can result in emotions, such as joy, but rather the filling of the Spirit is a mental state of the believer who does not have any unconfessed sins in their stream of consciousness and is applying the word of God to their thought process. The filling of the Spirit takes place in the soul of you and I when we allow the Holy Spirit to influence our soul, which he does through the word of God. Failure to confess one's sins as a believer not only uh, will uh, uh, hinder us from experiencing the filling of the Spirit and sanctification, salvation, and fellowship with God but it's going to hinder our prayer lives. Look at uh, Psalm 66. I'll read last passage. Look at Psalm 66. Verse 18. says in the Net Bible, Psalm 66, verse 18. If I had harbored sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Listen to what? My prayer, he's saying. Harbored sin, that means unconfessed sin in my heart. He won't listen to my prayer. Why should he? You're out of fellowship. Holy God has no fellowship with people who are out of fellowship, uh, living in sin, unconfessed sin in their hearts. Uh, The uh, Today's NIV translates that verse, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. Uh, The Good News Bible, if I had ignored my sins, by not confessing them, the Lord would not have listened to me. In prayer, the ESV, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. So we see there that if we don't want to confess our sins, that we're not going to have a productive prayer life. Many Christians are not having a productive prayer life and enjoying prayer because, and seeing any results from prayer because they're out of fellowship with God and because they don't have, they're not confessing their sins. Prayer is one of the means that God has given you and I in order that we might enjoy and experience fellowship with him. When was the last time you sat down and said in your prayer and enjoyed your prayer life? Talk to God. Talk to God like, I want to say a friend. He is a friend. He want to have reverence and respect. He's transcendent. He's holy. But he loves you. He's a heavenly father. Loves you dearly. He sent his son to the cross for you and I. So 
is someone also who wants to hear from you throughout the day. Prayer is a running conversation throughout the day. Now, there's certain times we're going to have our prayer list, right? We'll sit down, pray for a bunch of things, people and stuff and whatnot. But when, I, when you're doing the curse of your day, whatever your job is or your school or whatever, you're talking to God to help you through the test, talk to God, help you deal with a person at school, at work, doing your job. And I'm not saying you have to sit there and, and you know, get down on your knees at, uh, at, at work or school. You could do that. You could do it while you're doing something. You're working on a math problem. You can talk to God, help me with this math problem. Uh, you're at work. Do the same thing. I mean, you can do a, you know, a mental prayer and say, God, help me. I do it all the time. I do it all the time. I can be having conversations with you guys, one of you guys or someone. And I'll be saying, help me answer this question, God, to my heart. I'll be sitting in my head. You don't know what I'm doing in my head, but in my head I'm going, I'm praying. I'm like, oh, no, here comes Tyler's question. I'm going, oh, I'm going to handle this question. It's so difficult. It's just and I just asked God to help me, and hopefully I answered his prayer. <laughs> you know, I just answered his prayer, answered his questions. All right, well, thank you for being a good audience. We'll uh, pick this up tomorrow. What are we doing tomorrow? Tomorrow we're going to... Uh, we're going to look at, oh, uh, we're going to look at uh, re um, repentance in relation to the confession of sin. Is confession of sin part of repentance for a Christian? Yes, we'll find out tomorrow. So let's uh, end, end in prayer here, as is our custom. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this lesson will be a blessing to your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.